Hey guys, David Robinson here. Welcome to another episode of the Apartment Investing Journey. Uh, we've got another great guest for you today that has a great story that I think will be inspiring and uh, will help you guys on your own personal journeys. And so I've got Sam Froer with me today. Sam, thank you for coming on the show and spending some time with us. Yeah, thank you for having me, David. So Sam has a background in both the commercial real estate and startup technology space, uh, working as an acquisitions analyst at a REIT, was a part of acquiring over 50 million of multifamily properties. In the tech space, he has worked with both mid-sized and Fortune 500 executives to drive cultural change, increase employee well-being. Sam and his wife, Hillary, are the parents of two amazing children. When he isn't working, you are likely to find him with family at a beach near his home in Southern California. So, Sam, uh, as I always say, very brief bio, and there's a whole journey behind that bio that we want to just hear about and discuss and learn from. And so if you can, let's back up. Let's talk a little bit about your background and uh, how you got started in the real estate space. Yeah, happy to share. You know, it was, it was an interesting uh, journey for me and not, I'd say, your, your typical start. Um, I feel like I've, I've jumped into the multifamily space a little earlier uh, than, than most people do and a little bit different of a, of a way to get here that I see a lot of people when I'm, I'm talking to people in this multifamily space that started in the residential side and realized, OK, after I got one to five to ten investment properties, wait a second, this is great. I've got great cash flow, but this does, doesn't scale. And so they jump into multifamily. And so my story was a little bit different. And I was grateful to learn from a lot of those people to, to just jump into the multifamily space. But where it all really started for me was I was attending the University of Utah and uh, was looking for a good internship. And a lot of people said, hey, real estate's great, a great spot to be in. Um, you know, look into that. And so I found a real estate investment trust in Salt Lake City, um, focused on multifamily properties. And so I went and worked with them as an underwriting analyst. And most of you know, but underwriting basically means just looking at properties, uh, plugging in numbers, putting it in a model to see if they make sense. Uh, I was your classic punk college kid and had no idea what I was doing. Uh, other than just putting numbers in a model, I would see, hey, this has a you know 30% IRR uh, of a return and have no idea what that meant and just send it up, send it up the ladder without thinking about it. Uh, and after that experience, kind of, again, what I viewed as the, the cool, sexy thing was, was the tech space. Everyone said, you know, you got to be in tech, high growth startup. So I went and joined a tech company in Utah called Qualtrics. Uh, and that was a, a phenomenal experience for me that I was there for a little over four years. Uh, and we grew from we went from a couple hundred employees to a couple thousand, uh, ended up selling for over eight billion dollars to a uh, another technology uh, provider in the space uh, and had some equity in the company. It was definitely uh, the biggest paycheck I'd ever seen, not a life changing amount, but enough to realize, OK, you know, this is pretty great. But I took a step back and I said, man, I just worked so hard for the past four years. Uh, do I have to go do this again to have like this? this next event to be able to, you know, have a large inflow of cash, like, there's got to be a better way to do this, a better way for my money to work for me. And so that's when, you know, the classic starting to do research, reading the paradigm shifting, rich dad, poor dad, and realizing, you know, real estate's where it at is where it's at. And so again, started to really dive into uh, understanding what that could look like for me. And with that background, which I'm grateful I had of working at that rate, realizing and hearing other uh, stories, realizing, hey, let's give it a go in the multifamily space. There's a lot that says it's very similar as the uh, maybe the lower units, uh, just with more zeros, and there's some benefits to scale. So let's go big and jumped into it. I love that. That's a, that's a great little backstory there. And uh, obviously being from Utah myself, uh, very familiar uh, with Qualtrics and their story and have some good friends and that's, uh, that were still work uh, with Qualtrics. Um, so when you exited Qualtrics or when, when Qualtrics was sold, uh, you got a, a, a good chunk of money to work with. What were the steps that you took to to you know, transition into this commercial real estate space. I think yeah. I think not everybody's going to have an exit from a tech company, but there comes a point in everybody's journey where they say, "All right, this is this is where I want to sort of plant my flag," but they're not exactly sure how to go about it. And everybody's story is a little bit unique. I'd love to hear yours about you know the steps that you took to sort of break into the space. 
Yeah, I love I love that you bring that up because it wasn't just like uh, it wasn't all roses just to all of a sudden be like, great, I'm in the multifamily space and everything's going fantastic. Uh, like I mentioned, it was it was a good amount of money that I received from that exit, but not a life changing amount. Still had to keep the day job. And I actually still do. I'm a, a director at a tech company out in Seattle, Washington. I live in uh, Southern California, um, but it's all I, I was doing remote work before it was cool pre COVID. Um, and so still doing uh, that to an extent, most likely we'll be hopefully walking away from that in the next year or so. Um, but as far as my journey, I recognized right after that event happened um, and that I needed to find a way to bring uh, cash flow and investing into my life. And I wanted real estate to be uh, the course. Uh, and again, I was thinking that I wanted it to be around the commercial space. Uh, I, I realized I just needed to start getting educated. So I started reaching out to as many uh, family and friends as I knew in the space that were in any way, shape or form affiliated with, re uh, with real estate. I started taking, I was recommended uh, by a mentor of mine that I start taking some CCIM classes, which means certified commercial investment member. And again, just uh, jumping into really re relearning this space that I had started to learn in college, but completely forgotten about, you know, eight or so years later. Um, and so started with all uh, with all of those items, got this new job, moved to California, um, but again, realized I wanted real estate was a path I wanted to go. So I got my real estate license. I actually interviewed with Marcus and Milchap um, and they offered me a position as a commercial broker. But I also realized, oh, my gosh, I need to feed my family and <laughs> what it what it takes for the in Southern California. And what you can expect for the first year or two as a broker isn't much. And so I was not able to, uh, to make the plunge there, but recognized, okay, I'm going to continue to keep my day job. I'll kind of, you know, have my license on the side. Maybe I start figuring out a way to help others um, and explored that for a number of months before, again, just realizing like, no, what I'm really passionate about, what I want to get into is this multifamily, this investment side. And so I started to jump more into to that, found uh, listening to a lot of podcasts, a guy named Rod Kali, um, really got me introduced and into the space and helping me understand of, you know, what I could be doing in, in this, uh, in this arena. Yeah. Love it. Cool. So let's take it forward from there. Um, you started to get educated. You even went as far as I like, getting your broker's license. You still are working, uh, in your professional career, uh, while also pursuing, uh, uh, multifamily acquisitions. Um, what have you learned during this period of time that others who are about to go through the same process or a similar process to you that they should be aware of, watch out for, um, anything that you learned during this transition period to where you, you know, multifamily is where you want to be and getting your first acquisition. Any, any advice, any guidance, anything you've learned during that time frame? Yeah. I mean, most of all that it's, it's easy. The deal just falls in your lap. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm completely joking. It's actually a lot of work. Um, and I think that what uh, a few different things, right. That I, I learned through this, um, I'd say one of the largest was how to use my time correctly, that having a, you know, quote unquote, full-time W2 J job, looking to get into this uh, investment space, having uh, a wife with two kids under two. Um, it's, a, it's a busy time, right? But I also say like with that, if, if I can do it, anyone can do it. You just have to be very intentional with where you're going to put your time. And so I think you really want to make sure that you're getting educated first, uh, listening to podcasts like here with David, going to meetups, like really learning everything um, and talking to as many people as possible. Uh, but what's amazing about this um about this space as well, I would say, is the the team aspect and recognizing very quickly, like, wow, there's a lot that goes goes into this, right? From the finding of the uh, deal to the relationships with brokers to the relationships with investors to actually raising the capital to the lawyers and lenders and so many different areas and people that you're going to need to work with uh, well in order to get one of these deals closed. Um, it can feel a little overwhelming at first, but it's also a huge benefit that once you find out, like, hey. What's my, uh, some people will say, what's my superpower or where do I think I can provide value? That's really how I stepped in to recognize, let me look around and find people doing what I already want to do and go provide value to them. Go join a team that's, that's doing something I want to be doing and figure out how I can help them. And that's what kind of allowed me to jump into this while still maintaining a job and, and being able to, you know, close on an over hundred unit building last year. Yeah, that's great advice. Now let's talk about that process a little bit for you. Uh, so you bought uh, this 124-unit um, deal in Nashville, Tennessee 
in November 2021. Congratulations on that, by the way. Yeah, um, thank you. But let's talk about that process and this concept of team, uh, you know, uh, that, that commercial real estate, multifamily in particular, is a, is a team sport. Everybody says <clears throat> you've alluded to it here. Um, what did that look like for you in trying to search out and, and find complementary uh, professionals or partners that could help you on this journey where you could sort of lean into your, like you said, superpower, unique ability and uh, and still, <laughs> you know, work a full time W2 job and be a husband and a father to two little uh, two little kids. Um, that's a lot on your plate. Right. So mm-hmm. talk to us a little bit about that process for you. What did that look like? Yeah, at first it was it was specifically finding. Um, and I, again, this works a little bit differently for everyone, but one or two key people that you're going to say, hey, what, what's nice about this space is you're not married to each other. It can be on a deal by deal basis. You can really, you know, uh, feel things out as you continue to work together. But finding someone who <clears throat> you're really all in with. Um, and I found a, a great partner. His name's Michael Whiteley. Our, our group is called MGW Ventures. And it was the two of us uh, recognizing, hey, you're really good with uh, with the numbers and finding you know the markets based off a certain amount of criteria the markets that we like and starting to go and uh, meet with brokers go out to those markets find you know the types of properties that we want to invest in and then start getting you know what they call deal flow and underwriting those properties and finding ones that we like and starting to offer on them and my side will be really focusing on our investors people that we want to bring uh, along with us in this journey and actually raising the capital so those were two key pieces that the two of us said okay we're going to work together to make this happen. Now, there's multiple other pieces that go into this, right? As you're as you're getting your first deal, we had to find uh, a great partner that would be the key principal or the person, the loan guarantor, who's going to uh, have the net worth and liquidity uh, that is required to have this loan. So it was uh, reaching out through our networks and finding someone that we felt very comfortable that could work with us along that side, as well as right. This was our our first deal, and we felt very comfortable that we could. We could run a value add play and, and uh, you know, buy an over 100 unit building and be successful. But we really wanted our investors to feel comfortable and we wanted to find others that had experience in the space. And so it was finding others through mentorship groups, uh, through coaching programs um, that are just also, you know, very interested in the space to say, hey, we want to find someone else who's a little farther above us. Kind of that same idea who already has, you know, a couple hundred units to a thousand doors that's looking to get in on deals. And when Michael and I found uh, this deal off market in Nashville, we said, "Wow, we the numbers look great. So let's assemble a team." And we brought together, we brought in another capital group to say, "Hey, come raise money with us. Come manage this asset with us, uh, and we'll we'll really do this together to to bring this down." Yeah, love it. Great explanation. <clears throat> so, uh, you know what's interesting, and maybe the listeners picked up on this too, but your uh, previous commercial real estate experience with the REIT was as an analyst. And yet uh, you found a partner who is doing the, uh, you know, the deal analyzing for you and the underwriting. So tell us a little bit about that decision uh, to really lean into the equity side and the capital raising side and have a business partner that was uh, more focused on the underwriting and, and the analysis side of things. Yeah, good question. I think it was it was really leaning into what our what are our strengths and as I looked at my my partner, Michael, and as we were getting into this, he is just an at- absolutely not only a numbers guy, but very entrepreneurial uh, by nature. I don't think he's actually held an actual job in his life. He's uh, ran multiple successful e-commerce business. He started a couple apps. He then, uh, uh, through a mutual friend of ours, found his way into the commercial real estate and was like, this is such an incredible vehicle to uh, bring wealth and uh, not only to myself, but to others. And so recognizing that he had this background of running businesses successfully and uh, kind of, you know, quote unquote, being good at the numbers and the logistic sides of working with partners like people like brokers, we felt that it was a natural fit for him to focus on that. And on my end too, I would say I'm not uh, necessarily extroverted. I would say I'm a, an extroverted introvert that I can absolutely uh, have those conversations, um, even though they may at times uh, take energy, so to speak. It, it's where I really find my most fulfilling time too of really going out and finding people that I can be, uh, real estate is just something I'm so passionate about. It's something that I don't ever feel like I'm selling anyone. It's just sharing what is, can be an incredible opportunity in multifamily. And if the timing is right for them and if the opportunity is right for them, then it's like, great, I, I want you in this because I see it as something incredible. And like that feels uh, something 
that I'm passionate about that I want to uh, be able to give to others. So it felt like a natural fit, even with my background, uh, that we wanted to pursue it that way. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. So uh, let's push things forward a little bit. You, you, you mentioned the 124 unit in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I think you mentioned how you found it, but let's back up just a little bit and, and talk to us a little bit about how you originally sourced that deal. Yeah, good question. So again, uh, Michael and I had been uh, talking to brokers and looking at deals for was probably getting close to a year. And it's a crazy market as anyone who's actively in it knows uh, just with we submitted countless LOIs, uh, got into many best and final uh, rounds, and then uh, the winners would would beat us by over a million dollars. And we would just be scratching our heads at how in the world they're going to make these numbers, uh, these numbers work because we weren't willing to uh, we weren't willing to be very aggressive. Uh, we wanted to ensure that not only we, but our investors could sleep at night knowing that these were great deals and conservative in how we, we were looking at it. And so when this opportunity presented to it, it, uh, it to, uh, to us, we, it was through a broker that we had established a relationship with, um, had liked us, saw that we were young and hungry and ready to go get a, uh, to get a deal. And when he brought us this off-market opportunity of a motel that had been converted to a bunch of studio apartments um, out in the great, uh, just right outside of downtown Nashville, um, two partners who uh, couldn't get along and before they had just finished the development of the project, so brand new, um, but were walking away even before it was fully leased up, uh, we recognized what we saw as a great opportunity uh, and, and jumped on it. Oh, that's great. So uh, that year's worth, and I, I do want to emphasize that, a year's worth of networking with brokers before and submitting LOIs before you guys took down your, your first deal. And that's not unusual. That's, uh, you know, that's pretty commonplace in, in our market today. So uh, it, it does take some resilience and some consistency and, uh, and, and being willing to deal with a lot of no's in order to get that yes. So good for you mm -hmm. guys for sticking through it and finding a deal that worked for you. Um, you mentioned that this was a motel converted to studio apartments. Talk to us a little bit about the the overall business plan going into this deal. Yeah, good question. It was an interesting one because it's not your typical value add that we're tip, that we're we're normally looking at, where it's say like a you know seventies to eighties build that the majority of the units haven't been renovated, and we're going in and uh, renovating them and bringing them up to market rents. This was an interesting one in that uh, again because they had not fully leased it up. Um, and as they were leasing it up, they were just trying to lease it up as fast as possible to sell it, uh, that we recognized based off the comps around it, that they were far below market rents. They hadn't implemented uh, something called rubs, uh, which is utility billbacks, uh, that they weren't, they were paying fully for that and having uh, the tenants pay um, nothing in those regards. Uh, and just the development of the area itself, as we saw, um, again, as we saw that the rents here in this property were $900 a month and nine minutes away. And again, it was downtown Nashville, so you'd expect it to be a little bit more expensive, uh, but just nine minutes away, it was $1,600 for a month for a studio. Okay. We recognized, wow, there's definitely some potential here. And as we looked at the area and saw uh, another massive tech company, Oracle, uh, building a 65 acre campus and bringing in 10,000 jobs just a mile away from our property and a $2.5 billion dollar uh, multi-use uh, development coming in half a mile from us. We just saw so much going on in this area that we're like, we see an incredible amount of growth coming, um, but also a lot of levers that we can pull immediately um, to uh, drive up the revenue. And again, what it really came down to was a, was a fantastic price that we were able to get it at. Yeah, that's great. And uh, uh, are you willing to share the price? Is that something you can share with our yeah, listeners? Yeah, no, happy happy to share. Um, and we can dive a little bit into the uh, the deal itself. But it was yeah. a, a was a fourteen million dollar um, uh, price that we we bought it at. And as part of the uh, as part of the going through the lender process and closing the deal, uh, any lender is going to ask for an appraisal. Um, you know, from like usually a large national provider. Say here's what we believe this property is worth so that the lender will lend on it. Um, and it appraised uh, through CBRE, you know, large reputable national group. Uh, we just had it appraised for over 19.4 million. So we were very excited as, uh, again, we, we felt that it was more worth a lot more than what uh, what we were getting it for, but we were really happy to, to see that. And of course we're gonna execute on our, our plans and hopefully continue to drive that up, but it was great to see as a, as a starting point. Yeah, that's fantastic. You never hate it when you uh, have an appraisal come in uh, $5.4 yeah. million dollars above your acquisition price. That's great. 
Yeah. Okay, and uh, so you bought it for fourteen million. Um, it looks like you raised uh, about four and a half million mm -hmm. uh, in equity, and had about mm -hmm. two hundred thousand dollars in capex. What did uh, what did that? I mean, that seems like a pretty low capex budget mm -hmm. for a project of this size. Uh, what did that include? Yeah, good question. Uh, and that really came down to again that we were buying this uh, again. It was an older motel, but quote unquote brand new from the people that had just finished in 2021, uh, turning it into these these studio conversions. And so, as far as the the units themselves, I mean, they the the building, uh, the units, it all looked phenomenal. From our perspective, it's like where can we enhance the marketability of this? It's like okay, it's it's right on the uh, skyline. You can you can overlook. It's up up on a hill, and you can overlook downtown Nashville. Let's create some amenities that are overlooking right into downtown uh, Nashville. Is like uh, mm. the the gym or the yoga area um, that is you know perfectly situated to, for something that tenants would really love. Um, creating things like a, a dog park area, a grilling area, creating a, you know, a really big sign because it's right by the freeway and we figure that there's you know, great ability to drive traffic along those uh, lines. And again, there's you know, your normal wear and tear. We recognize, hey, there's a retaining wall here or some minor uh, roof patching or railings here. But in general, the property was already in fantastic shape when we uh, took over. Oh, that's great. Uh, yeah, interesting concept. And, and <clears throat> you know, knowing... Uh, obviously, you weren't involved in the conversion process. That was the previous owner. But mm -hmm. you probably gleaned some insights from what they did in that conversion process. Do you see an opportunity moving forward for more hotel conversion projects? And is that something that you've uh, you know considered exploring deeper after you know being able to acquire this deal? Yeah, you know, it's a good question. I think uh, because studios are not typically what... Um... The, the normal unit sizes that you're looking for, right? That you're looking for your typical, like uh, majority being two bed, one bath with a mix of three to one and a few studios as well. Um, what really made us comfortable with this is understanding specifically, and this is what it would need to be for us to, you know, continue to look at this because we recognize there, it could be a very lucrative option. Um, is something very similar to this area where it is very close to a major downtown where studios are actually one of the major demanded units um, within that area. And so we'd have to uh, definitely feel comfortable um, with that. Uh, but we've also established a really great, great relationship with this seller that that is kind of his bread and butter of what he is doing, that he's finding um, these motels in different really high growth markets where there aren't enough units in places uh, like Nashville and Arizona and other places. Um, and so his business model is to like, for example, this this guy made some great money. He bought this thing for five million dollars, put in a few million worth of renovation um, and we bought it for 14. So he was very happy from his perspective. And he said, you know, I'm willing to and want to leave meat on the bone for the next person so that we can establish great relationships. I can keep focusing on what I want to do and then upstream have someone like you be taking it over. So it's something that we would definitely continue to explore. Yeah. And so what's, uh, what's the game plan moving forward with the asset, uh, hold period sort of business plan and strategy moving forward? Yeah, good question. Uh, what's nice too about this space is you definitely have a few options based off what the market uh, presents itself. So we did a bridge loan um, that would allow us to, uh, after nine months, we'll be able to make a decision uh, if we refinance and kind of restructure our debt for longer term, or we could hold it um, within, again, this is a two to three year with, it could be three years with an extension. We could just hold for the bridge loan and during that time we say, hey, instead of refinancing, we already recognize that we can uh, achieve some really phenomenal returns very quickly for our investors. And so do that and then roll uh, our investors money into into the next deal. And so we'll definitely be looking in the coming months and year of what's going to make most sense for our investors um, and kind of their goals as well, whether we decide to um sell this quickly or to hold on to it and cash flow it uh, long term. And there's, like I said, with what's going on with the area, a lot of excitement there that um, there's a lot of reasons to do that as well. So, so we will see. Yeah. Well, um, during the execution of this uh, acquisition here, um, is there one thing that went really well that surprised you? And then also one thing that was a challenge or went wrong that we could all learn from? Two questions yeah. there. First one is what, yeah. what what went well, and then what was a challenge? <laughs> if you're all right, I'll start with what went, I guess, quote unquote, wrong first. Um, and this this was this was a difficult one that we. So you have your typical two month uh, closing, and you'll usually have something in the contract um, that says uh, for a certain amount of additional hard money, 
um, that you're putting in that if the deal doesn't close, you lose. But if you put in additional hard money, then you can extend it 30 or 45 days. Uh, and we had a, uh, identified a lender uh, that we, it's a very interesting space with bridge lending, that it's not just like your regular Freddie Mae, Fannie, uh, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, that uh, is, you know, backed by the government and much more likely to close. In general, bridge lenders are very reputable uh, with that as well, because if, if they don't, um, no one's going to want to work with them. But we had found a bridge lender that everything had been going great. Uh, we'd been working with them for the past two months on closing uh, the property once we had it under contract. Uh, a few days before we were about to close, uh, they reached out and without really giving any sort of uh, strong explanation said, we're, we're not going to move forward with this loan. Uh, which is very rare, but it was in that moment, just heartbreaking, like, oh my goodness. Uh, and so it was definitely a moment of composing ourselves and recognizing, again, it was a good deal. There was nothing from the financials, um, the appraisal, the third party reports, everything else that made us feel like, okay, we can't go get another loan, but we're going to have to scramble and really make make this happen. And so it was going back out, finding another lender, which luckily we were able to do and uh, really expedite that timeline to then close with them in those next 30 days after we put additional hard money down. Um, but it was, I'd say, kind of nerve wracking for uh, a couple days there as we were finding a different lender right before we were about to close um, to make sure that we pushed it across the finish line. And I'm guessing that you already had all the equity raised, or at least the vast majority of the equity raised when uh, when you had found out that the lender was backing out. And so that always puts a little bit of pressure <laughs> on you too, because it's like you you, yes. you feel an obligation to explain what's going on to the investors. Uh, that being said, there's no justification for the lender to back out and you don't want to create any doubt in your investors' minds, right? Yep. No, for sure. And that, and that was something, right, that we were very upfront. Like, like you said, we already had all the equity over $4 million, literally just, you know, sitting in a, in a bank account ready to be deployed. And then for this to happen and go back and, you know, there's that worry of, you know, what if the investors do get cold feet because of this, but um, again, sharing with them what had happened and the quote unquote reasons that the the lender gave it was nothing that gave any of our investors pause as they saw the strong you know potential financials the reports the appraisal uh, that they wanted to continue forward but it, again it was a, a nervous moment to be like okay we've we've got to present this to our investors and hopefully they continue to see what what we do yeah and uh what's something that went really well that surprised you yeah i would say this went well but it was with a lot of hard work um, combined. It was the the raising of the capital for the first deal um, that we brought in another group uh, to help out with this as well. Um, and kind of said, hey, between the two of us, we want to raise between four to four and a half million dollars for this uh, for this property. And it ended up being that the uh, our, the other group that came in and raised with us raised about one point five million dollars. And then my focus, right, and had been preparing for this for a long time and talking to people for a very long time of raising capital that I uh, went out and raised. Um, my first time raising capital, raised uh, about $3 million uh, myself. And, and I would say it was in no way easy um, because it was a lot of work. And it was talking to hundreds of people and sharing with everyone and anyone about this opportunity. Um, but it was also really cool to see like how many people are out there. And I think you as a listener will be surprised as you go to look for this yourself there's a lot of people who um, are either doing well in their jobs, but don't know where to uh, invest that money or just are not educated in understanding some of the opportunities uh, that are out there. What I love about this, and again, everyone has you know their space with venture capital and private equity and startups, like uh, you can be very successful with those, but there's obviously a lot more risk associated with it. And part of what I love about multifamily, there's risk in any opportunity in any investment, but it has historically been one of the uh, most risk averse assets out there while consistently providing fantastic returns. And so again, as I was sharing this with so many people, it was really fun for me to see the light bulbs turning on in their heads. It's like, wow, this is something that I would like to be a part of. Um, you know, tell me more about your minimums, minimums and, and how I can be invested in this deal. And so it was a lot of work. It was talking to a lot of people, but it was cool to see how many, uh, how many people were interested in this type of opportunity. Yeah. Well, three million on your first raise. Uh, that's incredible. Congratulations. Um, yeah, hundreds of calls, a lot of prep beforehand, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, and was this a 506B or a 506C? This was a 506B. All right. So you had had uh, you know, the, the year's worth of failing on acquiring a deal probably helped with the lead up 
to this acquisition and being able to raise three million in capital because you've probably been you know at least sharing your journey and your story and talking with people all along the way about what you guys were doing and you had a year runway to continue to build and foster more and more relationships in addition to what you already had when you first started this journey so i can imagine yeah. that was helpful yep exactly and to that point as i'm sure most of the listeners know but uh, as he as david mentioned that 506b it means that we can't actively go send uh this deal out to the masses that we can we can bring family and friends into it. They don't necessarily have to be what you call an accredited investor, but you can't just go uh, post on Facebook and say, everyone come look at this deal and invest in it. You have to have an existing relationship with the person and have had uh, confirmation that they're a sophisticated investor. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, uh, I want to start winding down here uh, as we close down the show, but i uh, got a few final questions for you. Uh, the first is, what's the biggest challenge that you're facing right now in your business that we could all learn from? Yeah, I'd say at this stage in the market, it's very cyclical, but it is finding great deals that we can feel very comfortable with the price that we're purchasing at um, that are meeting our, our criteria, that there's a lot of capital out there. There's a lot of people that are maybe willing to accept less uh, returns than we will for our investors. And so finding those great deals, I'd say, is probably the most difficult thing that we're continuing to work through right now by increasing our deal flow, increasing the number of uh, brokers that we're talking to and then properties that we're looking at. Yeah. And what's, uh, what's something that you're just absolutely crushing right now in your business, something that's going really well that we could all learn from? Yeah, I would say, uh, yeah, good question. I mean, having now acquired this first property and jumping into the asset management, I'd say things are going really well and recognizing finding a great uh, property manager, someone who's going to be able to hand in hand, be able to run the asset with you, right? As it's out in Nashville and I'm in Southern California, um, but finding a really fantastic Nashville uh, property manager that has thousands of units themselves and that we're able to have our calls to execute on our business plan and uh, really be able to trust even when I'm not there day in and day out, that they're operating on the business plan that they're wanting them to execute. I'd say that's something that that's going really well. Yeah. Well, Sam, this has been a great conversation. Uh, really enjoyed hearing about your story and how you got in the space and, and how you found your partner and, and the effort that you guys put in for over a year trying to find an opportunity that would work for you and ultimately <clears throat> finding through a broker relationship, this off-market opportunity, the, the hotel conversion um, into uh, multifamily studio apartments. And what a great deal it sounds like, you know, buying it for 14 million, having it appraised at acquisition for 19, roughly 19 and a half million. Um, and then raising 3 million on your very first uh, capital raise, incredible. Um, excited to see what you guys do in the future. But the last question I've got for you is, what's, uh, what's the best way for our listeners to connect with you and learn more about what you guys have going on? Yeah, great question. I would say check out our website at mgwventures.com, uh, um, as well as if you just go, my name's Sam Froer, check out my LinkedIn page, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Happy to uh, share everything and anything about this business. It's fun and exciting. And you as the listener looking to get in, um, want to provide as much value to you as well. So please reach out. Okay. We'll have uh, those links in the show notes. So if you want to reach out to Sam, uh, go ahead and into the show notes right now, click on one of those links and connect up there. Sam, again, an honor to have you on the show. Thank you for coming on and sharing your journey. And I look forward to connecting with you again soon. Thank you, David. 